Welcome to the California Appellate Podcast, a discussion of timely trial tips and the latest cases and news coming from the California Court of Appeal and the California Supreme Court. And now your hosts, Tim Cole and Jeff Lewis. Welcome, everyone. I am Jeff Lewis. And I'm Tim Kowal. The California Appellate Law Podcast is a resource for trial and appellate attorneys. Both Jeff and I are appellate specialists. We split our practices about evenly between trial and appellate courts, and we try to uh, make this podcast a resource for trial attorneys and appellate attorneys to give them some perspectives they can use in their practice. And a quick announcement. The podcast is sponsored by Case Text. Case Text is a legal research tool that harnesses AI and a lightning fast interface to help lawyers find case authority fast. I've been a subscriber of Case Tech since 2019, and I highly endorse the service. Listeners of our podcast will receive a 25% lifetime discount available to them if they sign up at casetext.com slash calp. That's casetext.com slash C-A-L-P. Today, we are pleased to welcome David Edinger to the show. David has briefed and argued many notable appeals, including more than a dozen arguments before the California Supreme Court. He is considered by many in the industry as a scholar in appellate law, and he leverages his keen insights to support clients' immediate and long-term challenges in the appellate courts. After many years as a partner at Horvitz & Levy, David is currently of counsel, where, uh, which he joined in 1982. His many legal publications include several articles on hospital peer review committee confidentiality. David served two terms on the Appellate Advisory Committee for the Judicial Council of California, to which he was appointed by Chief Justice Ronald George. David also publishes the venerable appellate blog at At the Lectern, which uh, with news about important cases and newsworthy developments out of the California Supreme Court and the California Court of Appeal. So David, welcome to the podcast. No, it's good to be with you. Now, I also did mention that uh, you, you are a, an esteemed alumnus of uh, the California Appellate Law Podcast. We were pleased to have you and your uh, your colleague, Dean Bach, uh, Boschner, join us on episode 22 to talk about the no citation rule. Uh, but today we're talking about a, uh, uh, a string of articles that you have been uh, writing on at the lectern talking about the California Supreme Court and our uh, forthcoming new Chief Justice. Um, so, David, we'll uh, we'll uh, get to the big news shortly about uh, about the state getting a new Chief Justice. But besides that, I wanted to just kind of back up and ask you what sorts of other things coming out of our court system in the past months have struck you as surprising or significant? Are there any big trends or storm clouds on the horizon? Well, uh, the big news is is the change in personnel at the Supreme Court. Um, you know, if if um, the election goes as expected, we'll have a new Chief Justice in um, in January, the beginning of January, and we'll also have a new Associate Justice if her uh, uh, appointment is confirmed in in November. Uh, so that's. That's a big change. We haven't had a new chief justice in in a dozen years. That's right. That's right. What about there's another um, the, the the three strikes law um, uh, in California is uh, is another subject that comes up quite uh, with some regularity in our courts and therefore on act at the lectern where you write uh, for our listeners uh, to remind them three strikes is the famous California constitutional amendment that was enacted by voter initiative that enhances sentencing to 25 years to life for three-time offenders of violent or serious felonies. So in my, uh, in my reading following at the lectern, I keep seeing evidence that the three strikes law could be in some form of trouble. In, uh, is there anything to that? Or am I uh, overreading things? Well, I don't. I don't know about in trouble, but they did take um, the L.A. District Attorney um, Gascon's case for review. They granted review just uh, recently, um, where he is uh, the the District Attorney is seeking um, to be able to use his discretion not to file char thir third strike charges against against defendants um, and there was a, a a mixed ruling out of the court of appeal on that um, I, I think they said that he he was obligated to charge three strikes but he didn't have to go and try to prove it at trial so that's that's the decision that the supreme court is is going to be 
reviewing, and that's that's in the process of briefing now. It probably will be a number of months before we see any decision on that. Was that a surprise to you when the California Supreme Court granted review of the Gascon case? That's a pretty important issue, so uh, which is one of the stated grounds for for review by the Supreme Court. So we, it certainly wasn't a surprise. It, it was big news that they granted review, but it wasn't a big surprise. Is the uh, Do you think the focus will be three strikes or is the focus going to be the extent to which um, uh, district attorneys have prosecutorial discretion to, uh, to simply you know, fail to or, or refuse to charge um, in these cases, or is it? I guess I guess it's it's hard to disentangle the two. But uh, what do you think is uh, uh, piqued the California Supreme Court's interest there? Well, I have I have to preface my remarks by saying that I am not a criminal law practitioner or expert or anything like that. But it, it sounds like it's more the extent, the scope of district attorney discretion that that will be before the court. But um, again, you know, that take that with my disclaimer. Yeah, it's, it's an interesting de- tension there. Uh, how much of that discretion is vested in the office of district attorney to make a decision not to charge, as opposed to the deputy district attorneys who are in the trenches actually doing the work and, and prosecuting these cases? I, I can't wait to read the uh, briefing on that case. Um, hey, let me ask you, David, you recently you brought to our attention, you recently uh, successfully briefed and argued a pro bono. Uh, case before the California Supreme Court, Guardianship of Saul H. And this was a case about uh, migrant children and obtaining findings from the California courts. Can you tell us two things? Can you tell us a little bit about the case? And two, there's an unusual issue regarding uh, uh, the appointment of counsel, your your opponent. Could you uh, tell us a little bit about that? Sure. I, I can t- I'll try to give you the Reader's Digest version because okay. it's kind of complicated. Um, Congress established a very unique kind of system um, where uh, the the state courts, the courts of of all 50 states, perform uh, a fact-finding function for the federal government on certain immigration matters. Um, Juveniles are entitled to some protected status. It's called special immigrant juvenile status. Um, If uh, they can apply, they can only apply to the federal government for that status if they first get a finding from uh, a state court that reunification with one or both of their parents is not viable. That's the term that's used in the statute, not viable because of abuse, neglect, abandonment, or similar basis under state law. So that's what this, that's why this immigration case was in a state court in the first place, because Congress requires state court findings. And um, the Superior Court uh, refused to make the, the necessary findings. The Court of Appeal affirmed that refusal. And then the Supreme Court granted review. And you mentioned the unusual nature of of uh, the of our quote unquote opponent. Um, there was no opposition to our client's petition for these findings, and there was no opposition to to our appeal either in the Court of Appeal. When the Supreme Court granted review, they obviously didn't want to have one-sided briefing. So they um, enlisted as pro bono counsel, the Grainis Martin uh, firm to, um, to be what, they, what the court called amicus curiae, but which the court said they would treat that amicus curiae brief as the answer brief on the merits. Um, and uh, the Grainis firm is really to be commended for, for taking that on. Not only did they do it pro bono, but the Supreme Court set a very tight uh, briefing and argument schedule. So they had, um, they had very little time to, yeah. to get up to speed. They were just dropped into this case after review was granted. And uh, they, yeah, they had very little time to get up to speed on it. 
Yeah, this seems like a really interesting case, and I think we, we could probably get bogged in the weeds in it, but uh, I, I'm I'm curious if there were other states who uh, that have taken this issue up. You mentioned that this is a, a federal law that uh, that it basically invites or allows state courts to make findings uh, that would be that would be used by uh, by what the immigration authorities to determine uh, a path to uh, permanent resident status for minors. And were there other states who were likewise refusing to make these findings and saying, you know, keep me out of this. This is a federal issue. Or was California alone? Or was the California Superior Court and Court of Appeal alone in that at that point? Not alone, um, certainly. And, it, and it's not um, it's not inviting state court findings. It's requiring state court oh. findings. Yeah. If you don't get those state court findings, the the child cannot apply to the federal government, period. By requiring uh, the various state courts to do that, does uh, does the federal law risk uh, inviting inconsistent standards in uh, in the making of those findings? I, well, in a way, yes, but I think that's by design. Um, they recognize that uh, I think the I think Congress recognized that different states might have different standards for uh, for judging what is abuse, neglect, or abandonment, or a similar basis. Yeah. So, but but other you asked about other states. Yeah, other states. There had been some problems in the lower courts, and um, there were some you know good opinions that came out of the high courts of states like Maryland and Nevada and Vermont. I'm probably missing a couple. Um, you know, so so California is not unique in trying to to flesh out this 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 issue. So just in our in our light banter here, David, we've talked about immigration. We've talked about the three strikes law and prosecutorial <laughs> discretion. Um, and uh, but what we were really here to talk about is the uh, is the news right from the top, which is uh, the changing of the guard in the in the California Supreme Court. Um, uh, the news from the California Supreme Court is that the Chief Justice uh, Tani Cantil Sakuye is retiring. So let's discuss. Uh, I want to discuss with you first some big picture questions, uh, inclu uh, including the Chief Justice's legacy, uh, and then maybe we'll talk about some uh, nuts and bolts about the, how the transition works. And there's uh, been a little bit of controversy, at least for us legal nerds, uh, controversy about uh, about the way the uh, the new appointment is happening, or is it an appointment or a nomination, or which should it be, and what's the difference, and uh, does it matter? And uh, and then we'll talk about who's going to be serving as our new chief justice. So uh, so let's uh, first talk about uh, uh, our outgoing chief justice, uh, uh, Tani Kantil Sakuye. Uh, she's announced her retirement from the California Supreme Court after 11 years as chief justice. Um, so let me ask you, David. Um, uh, to uh, at the outset here, just to engage in some rank speculation for us by uh, telling us why do you think she's retiring? Um, well, yeah, it is. It's definitely rank speculation because <laughs> I, I don't know. But the thing is, spending it, it will be twelve years by the time she retires, and um, it, it under under just normal times, the chief justice job is. In, an incredibly taxing one. Um, it's the she's she's um, got two very much more than full time jobs that she's handling. So she's not only the leader of the Supreme Court and pulling her weight as one of seven justices on the Supreme Court with the caseload, but she's also leading the she's also head of the largest judiciary i think in the entire world as far as number of judicial officers is concerned it's larger than the federal system, judicial system um you know and, and um that's that's under just normal times um but as she mentioned um her tenure was bookended has been bookended by uh, the Great Recession and drastic budget cuts when she when she came into office, and by the pandemic when she's when she's leaving office. In fact, the pandemic probably is covering about twenty percent of her tenure, twenty to twenty five percent of her tenure by the time she retires. So, given all that, um, my guess is that. It's it's the, the taxing nature 
the very difficult nature of the job as to as to why she's retiring. And that, that's my guess. That that seems like a good hunch when you, uh, David, when you mentioned to me about how her her tenure has been bookended, as you said, by the by the recession at the beginning uh, and all the drastic budget cuts and then the pandemic. Um, I went back and looked at your uh, one of your uh, articles on at the lectern about uh, about the pandemic docket on the California California Supreme Court, and there have been extraordinary uh, petitions filed in the Supreme Court to reduce, for example, youth populations and juvenile detention centers, to transfer prison inmates, to postpone the bar exam, or to make it available remotely, and literally dozens of other extraordinary petitions that you've listed in your in your article that the Supreme Court has has had to take up and decide in the wake of the pandemic. And yeah, I think, uh, like I said, I think it's a good hunch on your part that um, that having to administer um, the court uh, in our in, in our judiciary during this difficult uh, pandemic, um, you know, must have played a role. Do you think that if she had if she was just an associate justice and not the chief justice, uh, maybe she would have she would have stuck around for another term? That, that's very possible. Uh, that's very possible. I mean, the, the pandemic um, was. Uh, burdensome for the added significant burden to the court um, in general, all, all seven justices, not, not just the chief justice, because mm -hmm. um, besides having to adjust to um, operating remotely, they had all these additional cases that, that came up uh, that in petitions for review and, and emergency, um, emergency petitions for relief that came up that they wouldn't have otherwise had on top of all the other stuff that they normally deal with. Now, David, you mentioned that uh, the Chief Justice really has two full-time jobs. She is a uh, she's a justice. She writes. She has her opinion writing duties like every other associate justice, but she also has uh, the job of managing uh, the uh, the court and the judiciary system. Given all of the administrative duties the Chief Justice has. Uh, does this mean, because when you say that two full-time jobs, uh, I get your point, but we all uh, have the same 24 hours in a day. Uh, so does uh, does does her uh, her commitments and her duties uh, on the administrative side, does that imp impact the her ability to write decisions? Does she not get to write as many decisions as maybe she would have liked? Does this mean that the chief justice maybe in, in a certain sense is less influential than other justices if, if uh, all the administrative duties take away time to uh, to write uh, write the opinions that they otherwise might like to have uh, taken up? I, I haven't done a count of, you know, how many opinions she's written versus how many opinions other justices have written. My sense, though, is that she is carrying her weight as, um, as, as a justice and producing, you know, around the same number of opinions as, as other justices on the court. Um, so I... I I don't think that's an issue, but certainly, you know, the point you make about there's only 24 hours in her day, just like anybody else's, um, you know, the, she might, she very well may have to rely more on, on her staff um, than other justices would have to rely so to, to get opinions yeah. put together. Are there any, most of the time we talk about uh, changes on a Supreme Court. It's usually the United States Supreme Court, and uh, most uh, a lot of commentators will note that the United States Supreme Court is uh, tends to be more, um, shall we say, raucous than is maybe the uh, California Supreme Court by comparison, and that the California Supreme Court tends, uh, and maybe one of the reasons for that is that our Supreme Court tends to be more ideologically homogeneous. And uh, is there any reason to think that this may play a role in the chief? Justice's uh, decision to retire, if if she thinks that that the that there is a there's not going to be an ide a big ideological shakeup uh, if she uh, steps down and is replaced, um, does that uh, help assuage concerns when a chief justice might decide to retire? Um, I I would yeah I, again this is really speculation because I I don't know the chief um, you know but. Uh, I, I would think that some thought is given to any justice when, you know, when they're contemplating retiring, who might be taking their place on the court. Um, you know, the, the chief justice may have been 
um, made more confident in her decision to retire by Governor Newsom's appointment of Justices Jenkins and Guerrero and found out and, you know, after she works, has worked with both of them on the court, um, she's confident that um, that they're solid choices for for serving on the court and that um, Governor Newsom would be picking somebody good to to fill the vacancies. Okay, and so, uh, and then to loop back around to the point you made about um, about the productivity of the court and the, the challenges that the Chief Justice has faced, uh, one of the other topics that you've written about recently on at the lectern is, uh, is that the, the court has experienced a bit of a decline in productivity in recent years. And uh, I, I found these, uh, uh, John Eisenberg um, also has, has noted, uh, I, I noted down these quotes from Mr. Eisenberg. He says that yearly output of written opinions has plummeted an, an alarming 61% com, uh, compared to a decade ago. And uh, uh, I wondered if the cause of this decline in, pro in productivity uh, can be traced back to the pandemic, or do you think it uh, predates the pandemic and has other causes? Um, well, I think it does predate the pandemic. Um, I think the pandemic probably exacerbated the problem. Um, probably having to work remotely exacerbated the problem. Um, also, there were some lengthy vacancies on on the court, which um, which reduces reduces the productivity. I think, but there there are probably other factors too involved, which I'm not sure. You know, other internal factors as to why. Um, why there just hasn't been as many opinions filed and as many petitions for review granted as in past years. All right, well, let's move on to talk about uh, Chief Justice uh, Kantil Sakaue's legacy as a Chief Justice. Um, now, uh, David, you had mentioned to me offline here a few, uh, a few issues and cases that that may be candidates for uh, for part of the chief justice's legacy. You, you mentioned to me uh, the Im uh, immigration and that the chief had given harsh criticism of ICE arrests at California courthouses. You had mentioned uh, on the on the topic of civics that the chief has promoted civics education in California schools, and and then there are other notable opinions like the Dynamex opinion in Vasquez, uh, Bristol Myers, uh, In Ray Richards. Um, you want to give maybe a, a little bit of a tour of of uh, how do you, how you think legal historians will rate the chief justice's legacy? Well, the first two factors points you you mentioned the the immigration point and the civics point. Those are when uh, the chief justice was wearing her hat as head of the judiciary. So it it really uh, it, it had very nothing to do with the Supreme Court itself. Then then there were the opinions that you talked about which are the Supreme Court. And she was the author of some substantial, uh, significant opinions. Um, I think she might be best known historically for her administrative uh, duties um, as, as head of California's judiciary, as head of the Judicial Council and head of California's courts. Um, and you know, one of those, one of the things that will be prominent, I think, is the criticism she had of uh, the last administration, the last federal administration, and um, having ICE make arrests at California courthouses. And she spoke out often and extremely strongly um, about, and, and publicly, uh, about um, how those arrests were causing problems with access to justice in, in California's courts. And she wrote a letter to, um, I think it was the then Attorney General and the head of Department of Homeland Security, uh, criticizing what she called the stalking that was going on at California's courthouses. And she said that California courts should not be used as bait by, uh, by the federal government for, for immigration arrests. Um, and 
uh, you know, that, that letter was just the start. I mean, repeatedly after that, she was, uh, she was critical of, of making arrests um, at, at California courthouses. Um, Would that be an example of how the judiciary, as being the, the least political or the non-political branch, can still have a political impact? Because the, the Chief Justice just speaking uh, basically uh, as a Chief Justice, not, not within an opinion of any sort, not within a case, but just saying, uh, just decrying that practice, did it have an impact in your view? Um, well, it didn't have an immediate impact, but when there was a new administration, the policy changed and she applauded the policy. Um, you know, I, I really don't know whether um, anybody in Washington at the time cared under the previous administration when she thought. Um, it didn't, didn't seem like it, um, but, but who knows. Uh, but she was definitely staying in her lane at that point, she was not criticizing immigration policies in general. It was just specifically how they affect California courts. And that's that's her job as, as head of the, she's the Chief Justice of California, not just the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court. Well, there is a separation of powers issues there. Yeah. She is, uh, she's protecting her turf, I guess you could uh uh, you could say of what uh, what she was was saying. Do what uh, do whatever you need to do uh, in in your own arenas. But in my courthouse, we'd ask that you not do this. Um, it, in a sense, I think that's right. Um, she saw harm to the California judicial system from this, and she spoke out about it. Well, and then let's talk about. Uh, we don't need to talk about specific opinions because, again, that would uh, could lead us down a. Uh, uh, deep rabbit holes, but uh, but just to name a few of the opinions again: Dynamex, Vasquez, Bristol, Bristol Myers, In Ray Richards. Uh, to the extent these these kinds of big uh, cases out of the uh, Supreme Court um, are uh, are part of the Chief Justice's legacy, in what way uh, does the Chief Justice uh, own or take credit for these uh, uh, these decisions? Is it because of the Chief Justice's role? in uh, in uh, in writing the opinions or assigning the job of writing writing the opinions um uh, the chief justice still just has one vote in granting review i take it but uh so what is what is the role of the chief justice there in in those opinions and how do they factor into uh, uh the uh, chief justice's legacy well i did see her quoted um i think it was a num several years ago uh saying that she did take for herself the task of writing some of the the big the big opinions, uh, the more controversial opinions, and, and she was quoted as saying that sometimes she will take one for the team, um, is the way she put it, hmm. um, and and I think that's accurate. I mean, there have certainly been some very consequential opinions during her tenure that she did not write, but um, you know the Dynamax and Vasquez on on independent contractor stuff. She wrote a um, couple of opinions uh, upholding a, uh, statutory limitations on pensions. Um, you know, it was um, uh, th those those were ones she took for herself. And so, when you say that, uh, or when she said that she would would take one for the team, uh, sh she was specifically talking about uh, writing the more controversial opinions. Right. That's 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 what she meant. Yeah. yeah, I think you've also mentioned uh, or, or reported that uh, that the chief justice would write uh, opinions in a, in a deliberately narrow way. Um, can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, she, she said um, in after she uh, announced her retirement, she was interviewed by the New York Times, and she said that um, the Supreme Court tries to keep their opinions narrow. Um, and I'm trying to, I think I wrote down, wrote down the quote. Um, she said, we may start off with a broad opinion, but as we weigh, as we each weigh in, we start to narrow it because we realize we don't need to speak so broadly. We're more geared toward providing guidance and clarification mm. on California law that I think makes the difference for why we are able to agree. Um, that that goes to the consensus factor, but yeah, she she talks about about narrow, about 
keeping it narrow. And in fact, in, in the case that, um, that I argued, briefed and argued, um, she wrote a concurring opinion saying that she thought the majority opinion answered some questions that, that didn't need to be answered for, for the resolution of, of the case I was, I was working mm. on. Mm. So, uh, so her discipline of writing uh, opinions narrowly is not necessarily one that is shared by all of her associate justices? Um, that's, probably, that's probably accurate. Um, yeah, I think some of the justices uh, are are willing to to speak more broadly, uh, maybe touch on issues um, that that don't need to be decided for that case, or even to make recommendations to the legislature to to take uh, new looks at certain statutory schemes uh, or make statutory changes. Um, so that um, you know, so that 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 happens and that's something that was less likely to be seen from the chief justice as a practitioner do you have an opinion about uh do you do you prefer a supreme court to write a holding uh broadly or narrowly or does it just depend on what side of the argument you're on ah that's what no it, not the latter um <laughs> i'm not sure i'm not really sure what my opinion is on that, um, you know, I th I, it probably is valuable in certain circumstances where where the justices see that uh, a statute is either unclear or its plain language is leading to results contrary to probably what the legislature intended. To point that out to the legislature and to have them to have, to have them take a look and make fixes. I know um, Justice Liu during his tenure has um, made suggestions regularly to to the legislature and and has been followed up on a number of times i think i think the chief justice even um many years ago uh and i can't remember what the topic was but suggested uh, a legislative change that the that this the legislature did adopt later on so i think that's a good thing one of the topics you talk about on at the lectern um, with some regularity is about uh, clemency decisions, and uh, I, I have to admit, when I read about those, I I sometimes wonder why uh, why I should care, and uh, and I but when I read a little bit deeper into it, I think it's a fascinating question, but uh, b because uh, because of of how it dovetails into the chief justice's legacy here. And also, uh, as you've drawn out on your blog at the lectern, there's, uh, there, there was a difference in the, uh, in the Supreme Court's tendency to, uh, uh, to deny more of Governor Brown's clemency requests uh, compared to Governor Newsom, who seemed to, uh, seems to have sailed through with uh, just about all of his clemency uh, requests. And so I wonder if you could first kind of tell our audience a little bit about uh, gubernatorial clemency requests in California and and what is the court's role there? Why does the court have a role in clemency decisions? Well, they have a role because the Constitution requires it to have a role, the state constitution. Um, the, the federal clemency power is extremely broad. Uh, the president has extremely broad power uh, to grant pardons and commute sentences. Um, and Congress has no oversight over that at all. And the Supreme Court has no oversight over that. Um, under the California Constitution, however, the governor's power of clemency is still broad, but it is a little more circumscribed than the president's. Um, if it, it, the Constitution provides that if the governor wants to uh, grant clemency to someone who has been twice convicted of a felony, they have to, that governor has to first get the uh, four justices or more of the Supreme Court to sign off on it. Um, so the governor, when when he's wants to pardon or commute a sentence for a twice convicted felon, he has to send a request to the Supreme Court uh, asking for the court's permission to go ahead and do it. And um, you mentioned that the court denied 
um, some of Governor Brown's that there were 10 times at, at right near the end of Brown's term that the Supreme Court said no. Um, and uh, that has not continued into Governor Newsom's, ten Newsom's tenure. He's been, uh, except for he withdrew one request, but otherwise he's been 100% successful in getting the Supreme Court to okay his, his clemency request, recommendation request. And, and in fact, there was even one um, that the Supreme Court granted when Newsom submitted it when they, when the court just a few years earlier denied Governor Brown's request for the same guy, <laughs> um, it was the same the same prisoner. I, I think it was a commutation of uh, a life without parole sentence, and uh, the the court denied it uh, when Brown submitted the request, and then under Newsom, the court granted it. Right. And you've you've written that the court's denials of clemency requests from the governor uh, are, quote, essentially court determinations that the clem clemency grants would have been abuses of gubernatorial powers, end quote. And that suggests that a denial is rather significant. And is the is the court required to provide reasons for its clemency decisions, particularly if you're correct, that they amount to a determination that this would be an abuse of the governor's powers? They are not required. There's no requirement to explain uh, their, their grants or denials. Um, and that abuse of power language comes from a, um, an order that the Supreme Court itself issued before, these deni before any of these denials. They, um, on their own, without asking for briefing or anything, or without any apparent catalyst, they issued an order, published order, I think it was about 10 pages long, where they in detail explained their role as Supreme Court justices in the clemency review process. And they said, it was a, they said, this is a very deferential review we're going to give to governor's requests for uh, clemency recommendations. And uh, the only time we're going to say no is if we think this is an abuse of gubernatorial power. Hmm. So the denials that came, you know, I think, uh, I don't know, about a year after they issued this order were very striking because based on the, this order explaining their role, it, the denials equate to uh, a finding of abuse of gubernatorial power, but right. they didn't explain why, um, which is um, one of the one of the few things I, I have criticisms of the of the Supreme Court on is um, in it is their lack of explanation. In fact, I remember seeing a quote of Governor Brown. They asked him. Um, you know, about these denial, these unexplained denials. And he said, uh, well, look at some of the grants and look at the denials and you tell me what the rule is. So he, he was perplexed. He had, he has no idea uh, why some get denied and, and some got granted. And, and that's just not a good thing when the governor himself doesn't understand the ground rules. Uh, for for how these clemency recommendation requests work. Yeah. When the governor makes the clemency request, does the governor support it by any kind of statement of reasons or grounds? Um, well, that's a separate issue. The, the mm -hmm. file that he submits is, uh, is submitted. He submits it. The governor submits it with a request that it be filed under seal. And um, it is, and the Supreme Court has automatically filed it under seal and they will entertain motions from third parties um, to open up the files, in which case they will then send the, court, the, the file back to the governor and say, okay, justify, you know, keeping all of this or parts of it secret. And, uh, but without, without those third party motions, the files stay secret. 
Right. Well, so uh, so the Chief Justice's legacy on clemency requests is uh, is in the black box, so to speak, because we don't have the reasons for for why uh, why they're granted or denied. Um, so let's uh, let's just uh, uh, end our discussion about the legacy um, of uh, Chief Justice uh, uh, Kantil Sakaue by uh, asking you a counter historical question: What would California jurisprudence have looked like if Governor Schwarzenegger had not? Uh, nominated Tani Santil Sakaue as Chief Justice back in 2011. Um, well, that's a great, <laughs> that's that's a hard one to answer without knowing who he would have appointed in sure. her place. Um, but I, I mean, the California Supreme Court during her tenure has been um, at least outwardly very collegial, um, most often uh, consensus driven. Uh, most of their opinions are unanimous, uh, far more unanimous opinions than the U.S. Supreme Court. Um, it's, it's unusual to have, um, to have any no, you know, notable dissents. There, there are occasionally four, three decisions, but not very often. Um, I, it, a, a different chief justice might not have handled the um, the drastic budget cuts as well as the chief did, um, might not have handled the pandemic as well as the chief did. Uh, you know, it's it's really hard to say, but those, those were the major challenges for chief justice in her role as the as the head of the judiciary. Um, as far as California's Supreme Court decisions themselves, I, I don't know that there would have been that much difference if someone else had been chief. Okay. All right. So we wrapped up uh, with the legacy of the chief justice. Now let's talk about some nuts and bolts about how, uh, how the new chief justice is going to be appointed and, and perhaps more, more interestingly, uh, how the uh, the new chief justice's uh, old seat, old uh, associate justice seat, is going to be uh, filled. So Governor Newsom has selected Justice Patricia Guerrero as the new chief justice, and to replace Guerrero, Governor Newsom has selected Judge Kelly Evans. But there's some uncertainty and speculation about whether the governor is nominating Evans for this for the seat or appointing her to the seat. And in fact, just before we started taping this episode on September 21st, 2022, David, you posted an article on At The Lectern stating that, quote, on November 10th, the three-member Commission on Judicial Appointments will consider Governor Gavin Newsom's appointment of Judge Kelly Evans to the Supreme Court, end quote. And you note that because Evans was appointed and not nominated, she will not face the voters for four years. I wonder if you could unpack that a little bit and, and explain what is the difference between uh, appointment and, uh, and, and nomination and why it matters. Um, well, let, let me do why it, why it matters first, because <laughs> that's the easy, but the, the, in this situation, why it matters is that um, Justice Guerrero being nominated for, um, for the chief justice position means she's the nominee nominated as a candidate for election at this November's election. Um, so she will stand for election as chief justice in November. But the appointment, because it um, will not take effect until after the election, um, justices only stand for election um, at gubernatorial elections. So she, so Judge Evans or Justice Evans, um, when she's confirmed, would not be uh, on the ballot until 2026. Now, David, you wrote a blog post at, at the lectern urging that the governor should nominate Judge Evans now rather than appoint her later. And in, in that post, you said that the governor has opted for an appointment. Uh, you said, quote, I think he should nominate Judge Evans instead because that's what the state constitution mandates. Uh, end quote. And you also point out that under the state constitution, the governor before September 16th shall nominate a candidate. Do you have any information about uh, uh, what the governor's office makes of this constitutional provision and why it opted for the, uh, for the route it chose? 
Well, the governor's office definitely does not agree with, with my position. I thought that, and I think that the, the governor had the ob constitutional obligation to nominate a candidate for, um, for Guerrero's seat um, so that that candidate, Judge Evans, who would have been, uh, would stand for election this November. Um, and the governor's office, I, after that post was, was published, um, I got a call from the governor's office where they were, um, you know, not, uh, not happy with, with that post, I guess, and explaining the governor's office was explaining what their position is. And then, you know, it's, I, I certainly understand their position. It's, it's, um, you know, it's certainly not frivolous and I don't think there's anything nefarious about their, their position. I just, I just happen to disagree with that. Is that something that the governor's office is hoping that, that you'll relate in uh, at the lectern to, to your readers? Well, I think in that post with very long post, I think I explained what the governor's position was as to why, uh, why a nomination wasn't necessary and why an appointment was the right way to go, which is the way he is, is going with Judge Evans. Right. Now this story, um, this story about, uh, you know, this, this, uh, this mini drama over a nomination or appointment, um, uh, ensuing from the Chief Justice's uh, announcement of her, her retirement in in an election year, it reminded me of uh, of, a, of an anecdote about uh, in 1968 when the Chief Justice of the, of the U.S. Supreme Court, Oral Warren, and Warren announced his retirement. Um, 1968 was a presidential election year, and a debacle ensued after President uh, Lyndon Johnson announced that Abe Fortas would replace Warren, and Fortas uh, uh, thereafter wound up lying to the Judiciary Committee about not having given policy advice to LBJ. And that led to LBJ ordering his staff to destroy all the Fortas papers. And all this led to the first and only SCOTUS nominee blocked by filibuster. And it also led to a norm that a justice, uh, a, a prudent justice should not retire during a presidential election year. And obviously, you know, I'm not drawing a comparison. We don't have anything like uh, such a scandal here, but I wonder if these nice legal questions that we've been talking about, uh, uh, nomination versus appointment, um, maybe they wouldn't have occurred if uh, the Chief Justice did not uh, retire or announce her retirement in an election year. You think there would be some value in a norm that justices shouldn't, shouldn't retire in an election year? Well, I mean, under the Constitution, um, Supreme Court justices' terms necessarily end um, in, uh, in a gubernatorial election year. So, um, you know, unless, unless they retire or resign before their term is ending, then um, you're going to have that situation like, like we, we have this year where, where a justice retires just before, just before an election, a gubernatorial election. Now, yeah, that is a big difference. Uh, the federal bench obviously does not have uh, retention elections uh, like we do here in uh, in California for uh, for judges. Um, but uh, an eleven year term is a is a long term, and uh, certainly if she had uh, if she had if our chief justice had run for another retention election, uh, she she could have uh, retired uh, sometime into her term. Could she not have? Yeah, she she certainly could have. Um, it's a twelve year term, by the way, not just year, eleven. Yes. So even longer, <laughs> even longer term. But yeah, all the court of appeal and uh, Supreme Court justices have twelve year terms. Um, but yeah, she could she could have retired before her term expired. Um, justice, uh, just uh, that's the way it more often happens. Uh, justice Cuellar, Justice Chin, Justice Werdiger. Um, I, I believe they all retired before their terms were up. Um, Chief Justice George let his term retire, uh, expire. So, so that's the way he retired, just the way that the current chief is, is retiring. So it can, it can go either way. Huh. 
Well, let's shift gears here. Looking forward uh, with the appointment of Chief Justice uh, Guerrero, or nomination, I should say, what do you think uh, we should keep an eye on in terms of changes to the court, or what do you uh, think will stay the same looking forward to uh, a Guerrero court? It, it's really hard to say because she has been on the Supreme Court for such a short time. Uh, I think just since March, I think is when her um, appointment was confirmed. Uh, she hasn't written any opinions yet, uh, which is not on the Supreme Court. I mean, she's written lots as a court of appeal just, justice. Um, not unusual for there, there to be that long a gap between joining the court and writing your first opinion. That's, that's common. Um, so it's kind of hard to tell on that. Um, you know, I, I have a feeling there won't be um, much difference as far as how cases are decided, you know, the bottom line as to how cases are decided. There might be a, a difference in the productivity of the court. We mentioned that the number of opinions were, have, have been going down um, and the number of review grants have been going down. That, I, that could conceivably change under Chief Justice Guerrero. Um, it's, it's, it's all speculation. I, I just, I just don't know, but as far as, um, the consensus and collegiality of the court that I would expect to be continuing, um, she, you know, I, I don't know her at all. Um, but from the little I've seen and read about her, it seems like she would, She's um, a very good candidate to continue the collegiality that, that seems to reign at the court. All right, David. Well, I, we appreciate your, your coming on the show and sharing your, your thoughts about uh, the Chief Justice, the, uh, her legacy, uh, what's coming up next. Um, are there any other, uh, you know, th there, th any other uh, aspects of uh, this transition that, that uh, our listeners should be aware of? Um, I don't think so. I, you know, there's, there's the election that Justice Guerrero has to win. She has to get a yes vote from the voters, a majority yes vote to, to become Chief Justice on January 2nd. Um, and, um, it, oh, the only other thing that, that I guess we didn't get into is, is the timing of Judge Evans' appointment. Oh, yeah. Um, you know, the, the governor has appointed and the um, Commission on Judicial Appointments will vote almost certainly to confirm her before there's a vacancy to fill. I mean, you know, the vacancy that she is filling is, um, is Justice Guerrero's associate justice position, but that's, um, that's not going to be vacant until January 2nd. So there, there is a question can a governor appoint somebody to fill a vacancy that's an impending vacancy, a vacancy that hasn't happened yet? Um, I think I found one court of appeal case that dealt with a municipal court judge, I think, uh, that, that suggests that, yeah, this is fine for the governor to do that. Um, and yeah, and, and so the issue is that we have a governor who is about to stand for re-election who is uh, nominating uh, or, or who is appointing uh, a justice to the to the California Supreme Court, but but to be uh, taking her seat only after the election? That's right, that's right. Um, and I I think I think he can do that. Um, and I think he probably has to win re-election in November for it to be an effective appointment. Um, but uh, I think it's a good thing that he's doing this in advance so that there's not a vacancy. There's, there's no gap uh, where the Court of Appeal has, I mean, the, the Supreme Court has to deal with bringing up Court of Appeal justices as pro tems to, to fill, to fill, temporarily fill a vacancy. Uh, that that has been uh, a, a definite problem for the court in the past. There were some very long vacancies, uh, unfilled vacancies um, that, that hampered the court's ability to function, to, to decide some cases. Right. 
Well, if our listeners are interested in much more in-depth coverage of the California Supreme Court and Courts of Appeal, uh, they should visit at thelectern.com. That's where uh, David Edinger writes prolifically about all things uh, California uh, uh, judiciary. And uh, that's going to wrap up our episode for today. Again, we want to thank Case Text for sponsoring the podcast. And each week we include links to the cases we discuss using uh, Case Text. And listeners of the podcast can find a 25% a lifetime discount available to them if they sign up at casetext.com slash C-A-L-P. And if you have suggestions for future episodes, please email us at info at calpodcast.com. And in our upcoming episodes, look for tips on how to lay the groundwork for an appeal when preparing for trial. All right. See you next time. You have just listened to the California Appellate Podcast, a discussion of timely trial tips and the latest cases and news coming from the California Court of Appeal and the California Supreme Court. For more information about the cases discussed in today's episode, our hosts, and other episodes, visit the California Appellate Law Podcast website at calpodcast.com. That's calpodcast.com. Thanks to Jonathan Caro for our intro music. Thank you for listening and please join us again.